All right, so anyways, out there in the underworld, in the place beyond your current conceptualizations, that's the place of death and nature, and it's beyond the, the light, and it's also the place of hell, and that's what you see here. And, and how, what do you, how, how do you conceptualize that? Well, one of the things you'll see, if, if, if you're interested in this sort of thing, if you ever go read the writings of, of the Columbine killers, the, the teens, they're very interesting, they're very much worth reading, especially, I think it's Dylan Klebold, who was the more literate of the, of the two, but he tells you exactly where he went after brooding and brooding and brooding on his, his isolation and segregation from mankind. So he's out there beyond, he's out there in a chaotic domain, and because he's tortured by that, his thoughts take an unbelievably dark turn. Like, it's unimaginably dark. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you could read that. There's another book you could read called Panzram, P-A-N-Z-R-A-M, and it's a fascinating book. It's about this guy who, I think he raped 1,200 men, so that sort of tells you what sort of guy he was. Extraordinarily physically powerful and brutal and malevolent, and he was kind of a juvenile delinquent type, and they put him in a reform school, and he was not well treated in that reform school. It's sort of like the worst of the Canadian residential schools. And when he came out, he was not a happy boy. And so he spent the rest of his life trying to be as destructive as he could possibly imagine, and purely consciously with malevolent intent. And then, and, and believe me, he was pretty destructive. He kept track of the dollar value of all the buildings he burned down. He tried to start a war between Britain and the United States. Like, he was all out for all out mayhem. His dying words, that they're going to hang him. Um, he told the guy who was going to hang him, to, he said, hurry up, you who's your bastard. I could kill 12 men in the time it takes you to hang me. And that's exactly the sort of person he was. And he made friends with this physician in the, in the prison who he thought was like the first person who ever did something nice for him, gave him a dollar for cigarettes, if I remember correctly, and the physician encouraged him to write his autobiography. And so he did, and it's, it's available. And so if you want a view, because, you know, you, you always think of people, you think, well, people have good intentions, you know, that you especially think that if you're naive and agreeable. So all of you who are sitting there out there thinking people have good intentions, you're probably high in agreeableness. But that's not always the case. People can have very dark motivations that are fully conscious and very well elaborated. And Panzeram was no, he was smart. And his book is very well written and he tells you exactly why he thought the way he thought. And so it's a good glimpse of exactly this sort of thing where you can get to, if you want to, by brooding on your specific misfortune. You know, and his, his basic credo was that human beings were so reprehensible that they should just be eliminated. And believe me, that's what he was trying to do. And these people who do terrible things, like the Columbine shooters, that's exactly what, for lack of a better word, they're possessed by. It's sheer malevolence. And the Columbine kids had a much more spectacular catastrophe planned than the one that actually occurred. And they knew it was going to be a full-blown media circus. And lots of these people who engage in those sorts of mass murders, they know about the other mass murderers and they're engaged in a competition. And the competition is who can do the most brutal thing the fastest, something like that. So you can't just be thinking about people who've, you know, who have good intentions but have somehow gone wrong. If you ever meet someone who isn't like that and you think that, you're just a tree with ripe fruit to be plucked. So you don't want to be in that situation. You have to keep your eyes open. And so, anyways, that's basically what's encapsulated in this part of the story. Now, the hyenas go after the little lion, uh, obviously, but they manage to escape. It's a very malevolent scene. And uh, Mufasa shows up at the last minute to rescue them. So, and, you know, that, there's also a mythological trope there, which is that if you go outside your domain of competence and you encounter something you don't understand, the first thing that you're going to do is look to the knowledge structures that you already possess to explain it, right? And that's the, you could say from a symbolic perspective that that's the manifestation of the father. Because of course that's what you're going to do. And you, you know, what's really interesting too is because I've had a lot of clients who've had PTSD and, and without exception, every single one of them was induced by one form of malevolence or another. They have to develop a very sophisticated philosophy of good and evil to get out of it because they have a worldview in which those things don't really exist. There's no such thing as pure malevolence. Well, that's fine unless you encounter it. And then as soon as you encounter it, as soon as you encounter it, you won't know what to do. And then you won't be able to get on with your life. You'll do nothing 
But think about that and think about it and think about it and think about it. It'll disrupt your sleep. It'll put you into a permanent state of preparation for action. Because the part of your brain that's detected that, which in my estimation, by the way, is the same part, at least in part, that detects snakes. It's the same damn circuit. Once it's seen something like that, it is not going to let you go till you figure it out. Thank mm -hmm. you.